Good evening, everyone, um, and welcome to our uh, first in-person program in a quite a long time. Uh, thank you for joining us tonight for this special Big Read themed edition of Witcha Talks. And uh, again, our first Witcha Talk since the pandemic began. My name is Sarah Jane Crespo. I'm the Director of Community Engagement at KMUW. We're excited to partner with Wichita Public Library for this event. Um, I have, yes, this has been a good one. So now on to the evening here. Uh, Waskar Medina is the current Poet Laureate of Kansas, lit editor for 785 Magazine, a staff editor at South Broadway Press, an op-ed writer for the Kansas Reflector, and a member of the National Council of, on the Arts. He's published two collections of poetry, Un Mango Grows in Kansas and How to Hang the Moon. His words have appeared in the New York Times, Latino Book Review, Flint Hills Review, Green Mountains Review, Kansas Magazine, and elsewhere. And you can find more about Waskar at waskarmedina.com. I hope you're ready for a fantastic evening. Now please join me in welcoming Waskar Medina. Thank you for the introduction, Sarah Jane. Thank you so much. I'm allowed to have my phone on today because I'll be introducing everyone, so uh, bear with me. Home means many different things to many different people. Sometimes it's painful, sometimes it's beautiful and joyous, and sometimes it's everything all wrapped up together. In the big Reed Wichita selection for this year, The House on Mango Street by Sandra Cisneros, Esperanza's concept of home is defined not just by the walls that surround her and the room within, but also by her family, by her neighbors, by her friends, and even those that are decidedly not her friends. It's the street she lives on, the junkyard nearby, the women and men around her, but it's also a place she hopes to grow out of and never return to. For those that have never attended an event like this before, you'll hear about home in many of its forms. You'll find our idea of home are deeply personal. Home for me used to be a place I had to leave, and it took years for me to understand that, that home is a place housed within me, like memories and, and family and hopes and dreams and aspirations. We've given our speakers some guidelines. They can have a maximum of 20 slides. Each slide will automatically progress at 15 seconds, and the entire presentation can last only five minutes. As you can imagine, it's a challenge to tell our personal stories in such a tight time frame. And it requires some creativity and ingenuity. Wichita Talks events are not usually themed, so it will be interesting to hear how some ideas of home are echoed by different speakers. While everyone's experience is unique, they are also profound. First up, we have Ty Patton, a Kansas native Ty was born in Topeka and grew up in Butler County. He earned his Bachelor of Science in History from Emporia State University and obtained his Juris Doctorate from Washburn University School of Law. Ty began his career practicing law at Reardon, Fincher, and Mayo in Topeka before joining McCurdy Real Estate and Auction in Wichita as general counsel, auctioneer, and realtor in 2015. Since 2021, Ty has worked as Thrive Restaurant Group's Corporate Counsel and Director of Real Estate. He currently serves on the Leadership Wichita Board of Trustees and on the Board of Directors for Wichita Festivals, Inc. He is also past president of the old Wichita Cowtown Museum, Incorporated, Board of Trustees, and was a candidate for Man of the Year for the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society. He currently lives in Benton, Kansas with his family Please, a round of applause for Ty Patton. All right, I've done this in 11 minutes in rehearsal, so we're going to go a little quicker tonight. Um, 
So my wife and I have been married about 17 years, and as we think back, and I think back about being a young couple, I think like a lot of young couples when you're married, your idea of home is very literal. It's your little first apartment. Uh, you think about buying a house and taking those trips to Lowe's and all that fun stuff. Um, but as you get a little older or maybe more mature, um, it starts to start to realize that maybe home is a little bit something different. And to the extent I have a thesis, that would be it, is that home is the people, not the place. Uh, and so for my wife and I, that meant family. That meant kids, uh, filling that home, raising kids. And so that was what we set out to do. Uh, and that didn't happen like it was supposed to happen. Um, and like when you have the any challenges in that uh, in the fertility world, you go to specialists and get referred to specialists and see specialists, and they say, everything looks fine. Don't stress about it. Um, and that doesn't work, uh, just so you know, if you never had a chance to decide not to stress about something. But what it did for us uh, was it kind of solidified this idea uh, that we'd been called or felt we were called that maybe adoption was our path forward. And that's how we were going to build our home was adoption. That's what we did. And almost immediately, as we decided to go to adopt, we were matched with um, a situation, which is a word that you learn uh, a lot in the adoption world. There's a situation in Louisiana, and it was so easy and so quick that we knew it was the right thing to do. And then immediately that didn't work um, for a myriad of reasons. And so we were kind of devastated, didn't know what our home was going to look like. And then uh, the Friday before Easter 2015, we got a call about a situation, a situation in Pratt. And so we said, they said, you need to get to Pratt, there's a baby. And so we backed up and we drove down and if I timed, is timed right, you'll see there's a baby, a uh, social worker, child in need of care case. There he is, Asa, our first, uh, kind of fell out of the sky. So on Friday, we didn't have a kid. On a Saturday, we did, um, which is an interesting way to build a family if you've never done it that way. Uh, but we thought, we didn't feel like our home was full. We thought there was, you know, we were, we were called. We felt like, you know, we were destined maybe to have more. So we did, went through the process again and put our name out there and we waited. Uh, and we got a call that there was a situation in Omaha. Uh, and we, we went up there when we met a gal, and then a few weeks later we got the call to get ourselves back up there quick. Memorial Day weekend, 2017, made it to Omaha, and there was Josiah, uh, a headstrong kid. Uh, ever since they unhooked him from his brief stay in NICU, he has not slowed down. So we had two, um, but we still weren't sure that our home was full. Uh, and so we thought, maybe we're being greedy at this point, you know, how big is this home? Uh, but we, we also didn't have a little girl, and so we thought maybe we're called to do that. So we went back out into the world and we waited and we got a call uh, out of the blue one Saturday morning that there's a situation in uh, Salina. And again, the situation um, means a baby. It's a code, I guess, they use in the adoption world. But we went up there and the social worker, we met a social worker and they, signed, they said, sign this form, here's your baby. So we, uh, we didn't, we had two kids Saturday morning. By Saturday evening, we had three. Uh, and you'll see a very kind of grumpy, just or Caleb is our uh, still grumpy kid that we have. Uh, he's a two-year-old. He's a very, he still has that exact look most of the time. Um, he crossed his arms and told me he didn't like, um, he did not like peanut butter and jelly today at lunch, which I know is a lie, but, um, but we had three. And so, you know, now we're outnumbered. Uh, that's a good place to stop. Uh, you know, you can't run man to man anymore, but we didn't have a girl. And, and I, I know my wife had it on her heart that we had a girl. So she prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed. Uh, sometimes just to say, hey, if we're not supposed to have a girl, take this away. Uh, you know, give us peace. But we weren't sure. Uh, and we had three. We didn't know what that would look like. Um, you know, sometimes it's hard to get selected when you have three kids already. And we waited. And then last summer, late summer, we got a call about a situation in uh, California. So we got ourselves out to Modesto as fast as we could. And there was Hannah. And so for those of you familiar with the Bible story, Hannah prayed and prayed and prayed for a baby, uh, and ultimately her prayers were answered. And so in this case, Hannah was the answer to our prayers. Uh, and then we have our little girl, and we have four, and I'm pretty sure we're done. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I think four is a good number. Um, occasionally, I think three was a good number, but I think four is a good number. Uh, but I say all that, uh, this is a pandemic adoption hearing if you've never got to go to court on uh, your laptop. Um, but our definition of home, our journey to home was different than we would have sat down when we were getting married 17 years ago. Um, more challenging in some ways, certainly more uncertain, uh, maybe filled with some heartbreak along the way. But I don't know that I'd change it because now home is this. So that's how I define home. Thank you.
all those situations led to a beautiful family tie. That's, that's beautiful. Our next speaker is Maria Curie. Born and raised in Mexico, Maria brings a different voice to the table. As a communicator, she understands that words have power, but how we use them is what really matters. She believes that leadership was meant to influence, inspire, but most of all, to serve others. Advocating for Wichita's non-English speaking families has become an essential part of her daily life through engaging conversations, creating new strategies to reach them and strengthening relationships with local community organizations. Maria joined Wichita Public Schools during the fall of 2020 as their Spanish communication specialist. Before joining WPS, she worked for five years in Entravision Communications Incorporated as a TV commercial producer and later Cantus commercial producer manager. Please, a round of applause for Maria. Hola. That was nice. <laughs> My name is Maria Curie, but I wasn't always Maria. In a previous life, my name was Adriana, Maria Adriana Larragagoñi, and everybody knew me by Adriana. I was a little girl, a little bit stubborn, uh, a, a little bit dramatic, but one thing was sure, I would never leave San Luis. San Luis is a place where I was born and raised, and that my, that's my beautiful family, a united and hardworking family with my biggest role models, my parents. They taught me how to live without fear, because when you do things for the right reasons, good things always happen. They also taught us, or taught me, how to believe in myself every single day. I was empowered by them to make decisions because of what I wanted, and not because other people told me that I needed. And then this guy, sitting right there, he walked into my life, and with his beautiful smile, he asked me to walk beside him and to believe that together we could build this amazing life together. So we did. We got married and we moved to this place that I've never seen before except on my sleeping bag tag. <laughs> Real story. <laughs> but what never, no one tells you is that when you start from zero in a new place, it's very difficult. Your heart gets broken and you're a stranger because you're not from here because of your name and because you were born there, but you're not from there anymore because you left. And it's very hard and it's very difficult. So where is home? My home was that. That was my home. That was my safe place. That's where I learned about life. But then we moved here and together we built a beautiful life. We have a five-year-old going on 17, <laughs> and an amazing dog that loves us unconditionally, especially on the days that it's very hard to love ourselves. So where is home? But most importantly, what is home? What is it? And I've been thinking a lot, I've been thinking a lot about this. What is home? And to do that, I had to reflect and confront myself as a mom, as a professional, as a wife, as an immigrant, and as Maria Curie. Where is my home? I'm a reflection of every single person that I have in my life, right now or before. When I was looking for pictures, I found, a, I found these pictures. They're not, these pictures are not about buildings. These pictures are about moments. So my home is not the house where I grew up with my brother. My house is growing up with my brother. My home is not the place where my parents came back every night after work. But actually, my home is having them as my guides. My home is not the place where I, it's not my grandparents' house. My home is every single conversation I had with them every Sunday afternoon that I spent playing with my, with my cousins and learning about life with them. 
I'm beside them. My home is not the place where I hang out with my friends, but my home is all the friends that have stayed in my life no matter how far and no matter how long. My home is not the apartment on Ridge Road, the apartment where Humberto and I first lived when we moved here. My home is actually that leap of faith that, that we took on believing that we could build a beautiful life together. And we have, and we're pretty happy. My home is everything that I am. Every single thing that I've gone through, all those lessons, all the light, all the darkness, all the, all the tears, all, all the laughs, everything that I take and I have within me, that's my home. So my home is where my heart can be, what it is, everything that it is, and where my soul can find peace. Thank you. That was beautiful, Maria. Home, home has memory. How many, how many of us visit our memories, go back and visit that home in our lives? Our next presenter is Dana McCall. Dana McCall was born and raised in Wichita, Kansas. She is a wife, mother of three boys, and retired Army veteran. Dana is known for her natural ability to coach, teach, and motivate children. She is able to hold their attention, keep them disciplined, and create a desire in them to learn. Dana is a creative. She has been writing stories and music for over 25 years. She has authored four children's books and one beginner's chapter book. And Dana is an advocate of change. She is the founder of the Legacy of Negasi Publishing House, which focuses on publishing books to support the positive representation of black, indigenous, and people of color families with a focus on boys. She and her husband are also the founders of Read Bro Club, a program which aims to improve reading fluency and comprehension in elementary age children. Please, a round of applause for Dana. Thank you. Repeat after me. I left my home for the army. I left my home for the army. The day I left, my mama cried. There's no place like home. There's no place like home. But what exactly is home? As a little girl, I thought that it was just this simple. A place of residence, a domicile. In my mind, that meant a structure. I thought it was the social unit formed by families living together. That meant a mom, a dad, a brother, a sister, all together in Ruth. That's what I thought. I didn't have that right then, and I wanted that for myself. I wanted it for my brother and my sister. And so I set off in search of it. 19-year-old Dana left home in search of home. You see, I left home for three reasons. Number one, I left for domicile, that structure that I told you about. Number two, I left in refuge. And number three, I left in search of a new beginning. You see, I would only return here for two things, my younger brother and my younger sister. I did well in the army, very well, but I knew my why right away. That's why. I left for domicile. You see, as a young girl, I moved from place to place, and I went to school after school after school. I met a lot of teachers and kids I didn't form a connection with. You see, my perspective was a little different. I wanted my own space. I wanted my own friends. I didn't have that, and so I would go and get that for my younger brother and my younger sister. Number two, I left in refuge. You see, 
My mother is a survivor of the crack epidemic that was so strategically placed in the black community. And the residual effects that it had on me as a young girl was worry. I learned to worry a lot, but I also learned to pray a lot. See, the worst thing I could imagine was something happening to my mother. And so I took on the role as young mama, big sister. I was a lot of things I couldn't protect us against. But again, I would get us out of there. I would save my younger brother and my younger sister. Number three, I left for a new beginning. You see, in my mind back then, my mom was a victim. I was nobody's victim. I'm a conqueror. My brother and my sister and I would set our roots outside of Wichita. We would set our own standards, our own traditions. We would no longer be bound by someone's expectations or somebody else's pity. <laughs> and let me tell you, when you want to see God laugh, tell him what you have planned. <laughs> That's the truth. You see, God had a path for my brother to follow and my sister to follow. And I had my own path to follow. You see, as soon as I was able to, to get my hooks on t into them, they were running back to what was familiar, what they knew. And that was a hard pill for me to swallow as I made my life about them. I, I had my husband, my babies, and so I was forced to redefine the term home. And I found this, it's to return by instinct to a territory by leaving it again. I had access to the whole world at my fingertips, but I kept coming back here to move or be aimed toward a target or destination with great accuracy, with great precision. I knew where I was going. My brother, my sister was here and I couldn't stay away. You see, I thought it was my family that I was coming back here for, but my need, my desire to help my brother and sister extended to my nieces and my nephews. And then that extended to my cousins, and then later to a whole demographic of boys. But so then I decided, well, maybe God just used my family as honey to this bee. <laughs> That's how he got me back. And so, if I could leave with you with anything, I would leave you with this. Home is purpose. Purpose is your destiny. And destiny is God's plan for you, right? And don't worry about what's behind you because that is what shaped you. Don't worry about what's in front of you because that's uncertain, right? But look inside of you because that's what will drive you home. My name is Dana McCall, and I'm so glad to be back home. Thank you. Thank you for bringing song to the stage. Beautiful voice, Dana, beautiful voice. Jose Trejo is next. Jose is a Wichita native and was raised by his parents who both immigrated to the United States from Mexico. Jose grew up playing basketball and soccer and used his love for soccer to open more doors of opportunity in his life. Jose is the first in his family to attend college. Jose is truly living the dream his parents had for their children when starting their lives in the US. He is currently a lead for Kansas fellow serving as the impact specialist for Empower, a nonprofit serving the North End Hispanic community, striving to help people and create change. Jose's passion is truly to help others and give back to the Wichita community. Jose is a huge family person and loves to see all the beauty life has to offer. A round of applause for Jose. Buenas tardes a todos. Mi nombre es Jose Trejo. For those of you who don't know what I just said, my name is Jose Trejo, and this is what home is to me. So, what home is to me, I used to think it was different things as I was growing up. As you're growing up, you're a small boy, you know, especially you're a son to two immigrant parents who sacrificed everything and risked everything they had so that one day their sons could have a better life than they had. So 
my parents immigrated here and my dad works in construction and he always used to come home every night around 6 30 to 7 30 p.m and he would tell me man i am exhausted can you get me a, a cold water bottle and fill it with some lemon i said yes sir i got you so i would get him that water bottle but he would always tell me asegúrate que sigas en la escuela y te conviertes a una persona en esta vida no hay nada con lo que hago para mi trabajo pero no quiero que sufras como yo so as I said, growing up, I always used to think, man, home is this building that has four walls around it. Sometimes it looks like this as it's being built, right? But I was a child, a young boy still growing up, and I started to realize, man, maybe home isn't just this building that has four walls surrounding me. Maybe home isn't this place where I just sleep at night. And that's when I started growing up into my late teenage years, early 20s. I started to realize home was more than four walls. As you can see, home was starting to be my family. I was starting to realize the true meaning of what life was for me, of what home was for me, what mi casa was for me. Mi casa was my traditions, my culture, my people, everything that I grew up with. Cuando estaba creciendo, when I was growing up, my mother used to dress me up in these cool little outfits for weddings and quinceañeras. <laughs> you could say, my mom made sure I had the most swag, the most drip, what, whatever you know these youngsters call it these days, right? But back then when I was little, I didn't realize this is what was connecting me to what home was. This is what culture was to me. It made sure that I knew what home was truly was at every moment in those weddings, in those quinceañeras, was those little jackets made out of crocodile skin, she really showing, man, I really am from Mexico, huh? <laughs> <laughs> but as I was saying, I started realizing these days, mi casa, my home, is my culture. It's my traditions. It's my people. When I left Wichita for a little, I was missing out on a lot of moments in life. I was missing out on these beautiful moments with my people and going to their quinceañeras. And that's when I, again, realized, man, home is not a wall, a structured building that has four walls around me. It was the people having these quinceañeras and I was missing these quinceañeras. It was missing out on hanging out with the people I was having these special moments as graduating. Home, mi casa, was mi gente. It was all these moments that I was having with all these special people. That is what home kept being for me. And as I grew up, it kept clicking in my head. It is not a building. It is not four walls around me. It is my people. It is mi gente. It is all these moments, all these memories that I started making. And. Hopefully, you know, this slide switches. <laughs> Again, I was missing out on moments where my family was in Texas. I used to think, man, Texas is home. Dallas is home. Yeah, let's go there when I grow up. But no, I used to think it was home because of the people that were, because of the people that were there. So once again, mi casa is my traditions. It's my culture, my people. Mis tradiciones, mi cultura, mi gente. As you can see, these are what makes home home. These are the people that give me a place to call mi casa. And earlier, I know I said a quote that my dad told me it was in Spanish. I don't know, a lot of us probably didn't understand what I said. So why don't we go back to that? Growing up, my dad used to get home late from work. 6.30, 7.30 every day after working in the exhausting heat, you know? And he told me, make sure you continue in school. Make sure you get that education. Make sure you become someone in this life. Yes, there's nothing wrong with what I do for work, but I don't want you to suffer every day like I do. And because of that, I, that stuck in my head. And I just want to make sure that you guys know, my parents, everything they risked, it's all planned out well, because as of today, one week from now, 
I am accomplishing one of my parents' dreams, and that's for their kids to go off to college, and I will be graduating college in a week from now. Gracias, Jose. Felicidades. Can we give him another round of applause for graduating college? Let's go. Our next speaker is Rhonda Welsh. As one of the top producing licensed realtors in Wichita at Keller Williams Signature Partners, Rhonda is passionate about helping people buy and sell homes at prices they are proud of. Rhonda is humbled by her experiences volunteering with natural disaster relief, particularly after devastating tornadoes. Rhonda has lived in Kansas her entire life and loves everything about her home state. She can tell you all of the best kept secrets for dining, shopping, and fun activities. In her downtime, if she is not with her four grandchildren, you can find Rhonda outside hiking, fishing, geocaching, or golfing. A round of applause for Rhonda, please. Picture the scene, small town America, sun shining, birds chirping, children laughing and playing. This is where my formative years were spent from birth to grade school. This happy picturesque time took place in Thayer, Kansas population low 100, stop sign zero. And I lived with my mom, my dad, and my three younger siblings on Watermelon Road. They still have an annual Watermelon Homecoming dubbing a Watermelon King and Queen. And as a child, I used to help my grandpa on Highway 169 with his watermelon stand. Mm, there were at least two of my cousins in every single grade from kindergarten to 12th grade in the same building. I was friends with all eight of them, half of them being my cousins. <laughs> Home at that time meant safety, security, and playing with the same children every day. Then without consulting me, my parents decided to build a house and move. I went to my first new school in Mound Valley, Kansas. I made plenty of friends there in the short six months that I went to school there. Then, as I was getting settled in, I came home one day, and my mom had the car packed. And she told us four kids, grab a few items, we're leaving. We were leaving my dad, my new school, my new home, my new friends. The next five or six years are somewhat of a blur due to alcoholism and domestic violence with my mom's multiple husbands. We moved every three to six months. I went to like nine or 13 different schools the red houses don't even represent all the places that we moved. Um, it, it could be in any moment at the night time, I would be deep sleep. I would hear um, my mom whisper as she tapped me on the shoulder, Rhonda, wake up, we have to move. The four of us would help my mom pack as much of a household as we could in a hurry and move, leaving behind toys, treasures, and not getting to say goodbye to my friends. That's when I started developing my superpower of making new friends, all the different schools I went to. That's when I started realizing that when you have a superpower of making new friends, home can be anywhere and everywhere that you choose to. I really missed my friends that I left, but I also had great excitement wondering who I was going to meet at the next school. As my superpower grew stronger, I could make friends faster. I remember clearly the day that we drove into Wichita on Kellogg for the first time. Small town girl, I was in awe of the big lights, not even just stop signs, stop lights too. <laughs> and BTK was on the radio, they were talking about him, he was a serial killer, killing at the time. My superpower did not let me down. Even though my class number went from eight to 800, I was still able to make friends very quickly. I went to three different schools in Wichita. However, even though we still moved sometimes in the middle of the night, I could still keep my mom safe because we were in a bigger city and we could um, move and not be found. So I've cultivated a great 
great number of friends in Wichita as an adult. And one time, about 10 years ago, I was asked to move for a job, and it felt like a 100-year-old tree just being ripped out by its roots. So I didn't, I didn't move. It's no wonder that with my abstract idea of what home is and my superpower being making friends, it's no wonder that my career is helping people buy and sell houses. Also, since I didn't have a traditional home growing up, coupled with living in Tornado Alley my whole entire life, that's what created my passion and helping with natural disaster relief cleanup after tornadoes mainly. I have experienced such a wonderful, powerful community of volunteers helping people. When we're taking their home down to the ground and the pieces to the curb to be hauled off, they just want to hear their stories or have their stories be heard. Uh, it, it's really powerful and I, I have I feel very blessed to be able to do that with so many volunteers. When a tornado comes in the middle of the night, it, it's not a whisper. It, it slams into your world and it takes everything away in an instant. Now, I am really happy and blessed that I get to celebrate all of my friends from the past, the present, and the future at my annual pool party. And I really, really have great, great gratitude and appreciation for all of my friends. Anywhere and everywhere can be home if you have a superpower of making new friends. I need to invite to that pool party. <laughs> <Just saying. laughs> I'll ask again later. Thank, uh, thanks. Awesome. See, I'm already invited. Someone else invited me. We're good. <laughs> Our next speaker is Jody Yauk. Oh, I'm, I'm so sorry. Excuse me. Let me go back. Psych. I'm thinking about the pool party. I apologize. <laughs> I already have a, a floaty on. Next up, we have Patricia Houston. Patricia is a victory coach currently launching Coach Life, whose coaching style reflects her belief that people can accomplish great things when they are acting from their true selves. She says, the only victories that matter are the victories that will impact your life. Let's experience those victories. Although she has been coaching for years, she recently obtained the Kansas Leadership Center's Leadership Coach Certificate. She plans to do all the good she can while she can. Please welcome Patricia. Home, where is my home? Is it the place on Ethel Street of my childhood memories? The place on Lumen Street where I raised my family? Or the place on Lost Creek where now my family gathers? Is my home the place on Ethel Street of my childhood memories? Of the sound of my dad's hammer constantly banging as he uses our young energy to stretch the place from three bedrooms to four, from one bath to two, and to create a big gathering place so that we can share more memories together? Is it the place of smelling Clorox and Pine Saw on Saturday mornings as we rush to clean so that we can enjoy the Saturday morning cartoons? Hey, 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 it's Fat Albert. <laughs> is it the place where we grew, our family grew from five to seven? Now there is me, mom, dad, three sisters, and one rotten baby brother. The place of loud, fun dance parties, jamming it out, eating popcorn and Kool-Aid with my sisters. The Saturday nights spent in my mother's makeshift beauty parlor with the smell of the hot comb straightening our hair, where we learned the lesson that there's no beauty without pain. Then all of a sudden, I liked a boy. And like Esperanza in the House of Mango, I began to dream of packing my bags and saying goodbye to Ethel Street because I knew I couldn't stay there forever. Is my home the place on Lumen Street? Where the boy, now my husband, and I raised our three sons. The place that my husband and I prayed for right down to the three bedrooms, two baths, two car garage, and basement. 
the place that we learned the lessons of marriage, the place where adulting challenged us, the place where we had to have the hard conversations with our sons about being black in America, the place where we repeated Saturdays filled with the smell of Clorox and Pine Saw to hurry to get to music rehearsals and sports practices and games, a place that seemed large in the beginning but now seems so small as my boys were racing to be six feet tall. The place where the boys' friends' cousins wrestled and played, enjoyed popcorn and Kool-Aid while they watched Ren and Stimpy. The place where a fire swept through and threatened to take our memories, we rebuilt, but it was never the same. This home became a place of so many lessons and memories and secrets that my three sons still share today. The place on Lumen is where they dreamed of packing their bags because they couldn't stay. Could my husband and I choose to open one more door? The answer is yes. So is home now the place on Lost Creek? A five bedrooms, three baths, and a full view out basement. The house is a dream and a prayer once again answered in a neighborhood far from where we once lived. The place where we used to warn our children about driving through. Now a place for new memories to be made where our parents, our sisters, our brothers, our children, our cousins, our nieces, our nephews can come and enjoy family dinners and game nights. A place where the grands visit for days and argue over bedrooms and what we should watch on TV while they eat their popcorn and drink their Kool-Aid. The place where we pay for our house to be clean with these new delicate cleaning supplies. But every now and then we gotta pull out the Clorox and the Ponzo so our souls can know that it's clean. It's the place on the Lost Creek where we, my husband and I, enjoy taking the time to eat together, plotting the memories we will make, and appreciating the memories of the places that we lived before. This is the place that every time we drive up, we are in awe because it's a sum of all the places that we loved before. Your story may be like mine, or maybe not at all, but the places we call home is the place that has lived in, we've lived in all of those places. It's in my mind that recalls the montage of conversations with family every day, that brings random memories to life like movie screens of people and rooms and places from long ago. It's a collection of familiar feelings that blow through our hearts when we see a picture or sit with an old friend. If your story is like mine, home is not these places, but it's me. It's wherever I am, wherever I choose to be. Home is me. Patricia sounds like a poet to me. Make me want to snap. Snap my fingers. Yes. Yes. Our next speaker is Jody Yauk. Jody is an internationally recognized master energy teacher, intuitive business coach, and founder of Certified Holistic Intuitive School. Jody helps coaches and healers to align with their vision, embrace their uniqueness, and confidently create their most authentic life and business. Together, Jody and her clients create a ripple effect of healing across the globe. Her website is Love You Be True. Dot com. That's loveyoubetrue.com. Please welcome Jody. Have you ever felt like hiding yourself in order to fit in or feel accepted? If you can relate, then you're not alone. I've worked with hundreds of women over the years who have felt the same. But what does this have to do with home? Home to me is a feeling in my body. It's feeling safe and free to be me. It's the peace, it's peace that comes. <laughs> it's being at peace with what is, and it is being on purpose. <laughs> um, a client once chose me that, told me that she chose to work with me because she saw that I sailed through 2020 with ease and she wanted that for her life. And I believe the reason that I was 
able to do that is because I'm at home in my body on purpose teaching women mindfulness, coaching frameworks, and energy healing methods that are offered in over 800 hospitals today. But I remember a time when life wasn't so smooth and I wasn't so on purpose. I was a computer programmer at a Fortune 500 company. I made a great money, I had a beautiful home, but I wasn't doing what my soul yearned to do. In fact, I was pretty much living life for everyone but me. I was hiding myself, sacrificing my purpose for fear of being judged, not fitting in, or even being disowned. And honestly, I felt like I was dying a little inside with each passing day. And what I learned is when you live life for everyone else, it comes with consequences. And they start small, and they grow over time. And it looks different for everyone, but for me, it looked like becoming very sick. I had a growth on my thyroid, a mass on my liver, two growths in my chest that were monitored for cancer. I was having seizure activity in the brain. I would get lost in the town I grew up in, and I couldn't follow a conversation to save my life. I had a list of over 20 medical professionals in my phone, and not one of them could fix me because not one of them could set me back on purpose and teach me how to love and accept myself. In fact, I was so sick that I ended up losing my job, and as a consequence, I lost my home. I was devastated. Everything I worked my entire adult life for was gone, just like that. I felt so lost. I remember dropping to my knees and crying out to God for answers. Tears streamed down my face as I begged God in desperation, please, God, I want my life back. I want my job back. I want my health back. What is it that I need to see or do or learn to get on with my life because I refuse to be sick like this for the rest of my days? And what happened next changed my life. I was guided on a trip around the globe with a knowing that if I went, I would heal completely. So there I was, sick, penniless, and faced with a decision. A decision to trust my inner knowing or to run from myself like I had been running all of my life. I chose trust, and wouldn't you know it, I was gifted an airline ticket to India by a dear friend. So still very sick and facing my fears and doubts, I went on a quest for health, for happiness, for healing, I went on a quest for home. I studied with mentors. I became certified in mindfulness, life coaching, and energy healing. And I began to accept myself as a woman on a mission to change and transform lives, starting first with myself. And day by day, I chose courage over fear. I felt less like hiding and more like serving. And for the first time, Probably in my entire life, I was able to look in the mirror and actually see the beauty in my own reflection. I was home. When I returned to the USA, I was amazed to find that testing showed there was no mass on my liver, no growth on my thyroid, and the growths in my chest had shrunk to dense material only. My family physician said there's no scientific explanation for this. The only true healing is spiritual healing and in that moment I dedicated my life to spiritual healing and I went on to found an online school with a global mission teaching women how to embrace their inner knowing start a healing business from a space of self mastery and together we create a ripple effect of healing and empowerment across the globe together we teach people how to come home listen if you're hiding for fear of judgment what is it costing you what needs to change? And can you put courage over fear in order to come home to yourself once again because you deserve to feel at home? Thank you. Thank you for that beautiful story of healing. I wish everyone in this space spiritual healing at all times. The next presentation is by Alejandro Arias Esparza. Born in Aguascalientes, Mexico, Alejandro attended Wichita High School East and went on to earn a bachelor's degree as a first generation student in political science. Alejandro now serves as a civic engagement manager 
at the Cantus Leadership Center, where he takes on the role of project manager for a variety of civic engagement initiatives around the state of Kansas. Alejandro considers himself a proud Wichitan, a proud Kansan, and a proud first generation immigrant. Please welcome Alejandro. So I guess it's kind of important to go to public speaking class, ain't it? <laughs> I skipped it a few times. Well, yeah, my name is Alejandro Arias. Thank you so much for that introduction. And today, it, this story is kind of peculiar because I couldn't figure out if it was a sob story, if it was supposed to be funny, if I was supposed to be informative. So it is what it is, and you interpret it, and you let me know how it goes. I'll send you a, a Yelp review and stuff like that. I'll send you the link. <laughs> I do want to make one thing clear that this is not my story. Uh, this is a story of a single mother and two kids trying to find something. I'm not sure what that something is, but I call it stability. And I think we found it today. And unfortunately, my mom couldn't be here, but my sister is here. So I do want to say that this is for her. <laughs> now, having said that, I will make funny, uh, some jokes if I get nervous. So this whole thing is going to be a stand-up comedy show. But our story began in Ojo Caliente, Calvillo, Aguascaliente. Say that three times, add my name to it, and you have a whole fill-out form to do. <laughs> this beautiful town is what I call home today. Right? It's, it's the place that I go to whenever I can. It's the place that I drive to Dallas to take a cheaper flight there because it's so expensive to fly out of Wichita. But this is where I start. We lived in a very humble home. Two bedrooms, one bathroom. Every now and then, it was two bedrooms, no bathroom, sometimes only a bathroom, and a bed in the middle of the living room where I would have to sleep. Now this home today is almost in ruin just because we can't keep up with it, but every year we go, we sort of make it a point to at least go inside, look around, reminisce, get back out. But then one, my, one, one day my mom said, we're moving to California. And I was like, yes, the beach, palm trees, everything everybody always dreams of, and then my mom said, no, it's Fontana, California. <laughs> it's the desert, there's barely any palm trees, it's hot, and today half of it is owned by Amazon, so you put those two together. Now, California wasn't bad, right? We got to hang out with my aunt very closely because we shared a three-bedroom home, three ba two bathrooms, or three bathrooms, three dogs, eight, nine, eight, seven, six, five people, depending on the week. Um, so it was tight. We got really close, a little too close. But it was 2008, and the big recession hit. So my mom said, we're going to Texas. Now down here it says, we should skip over that, because I don't like Texas. I don't even have a picture of the house that we lived in Texas, because it was a mobile home with seven bedrooms, if you can believe that. And the month before we left, my mom was, wait, I found an eighth one. <laughs> and then one day out of nowhere, my mom says, hey, there's a, there's a snake. And I was like, oh yeah, cool. And she's like, no, it's a, it's a big snake. It was a 20 foot python. So my mom said, nope, we're leaving Texas. And then she says, we're going to Kansas. And I was like, where's Kansas? She says, I don't know, I think it's north. And I was like, cool. And she says, do you know anybody there? And then she was like, I think we have a cousin. And I was like, cool, but we did. So I worked out and then we shared another home with them. A two bedroom, one bathroom, seven people in this house and a ferret. No one liked the ferret because the ferret, the ferret did not like to get pet. So we were here, we grew really close, and then two months later we got our first own place in a place called Plainview. If you've never been to Plainview, you should. It's two bedrooms, one laundry room, one dog, and I slept in the laundry room. Believe it or not, you can fit a twin mattress in a laundry room, but nothing else. No, that worked out pretty great, and I think my sister appreciated the closet space that she never had before, and she might have overran her space because then my mom said we have to move again to a four-bedroom, two-bathroom, two-dog house with a lot of closet space, and now my sister owns two of those rooms. A ridiculous amount of clothes. So you might be wondering, what is your point? Are you selling us a house? Do you also work in real estate? <laughs> yes, and I'll leave you my contact information. But that's not the point. The point is that this is a story of three people running around with a huge support system behind them, trying to help them find maybe not even a home on purpose, maybe just stability. And we just so happen to find that, to find home and peace and clarity. Now, I don't want us three to take credit for everything we did because we could not do it alone. You might be wondering, you had so many numbers, Alejandro. What does that mean? Why the ferret? Why the dogs? Well, all those numbers added up to 106. 
And that's how big my family is. We have 106 people. My sister's pregnant with the 107th one, so give her a big round of applause for that. So tonight I want to dedicate this and everything I've ever done and everything I will ever do to those 106 people and the 107th one and also to my beautiful girlfriend Laura out there who said if I didn't give her a shout out she wouldn't let me sleep there tonight. <laughs> Having said that, thank you. Thank you for sharing that story. Our next speaker is Susie Finn. Susie is a futurist. That's okay to clap. Good clap. Yeah, that's, that's, that's. Susie is a futurist. She thrives on connecting people, ideas, and resources in exciting new ways to help people, companies, organizations, and communities realize their potential. She has a degree in public relations with a minor in studio art from Marquette University and a master of business administration from Wichita State University. A boomeranger, she returned to Wichita in 2009 after spending four years in Washington, D.C. When she's not experiencing cool community events, Susie enjoys spending quality time with family and friends, playing trivia, attempting to be athletic by swimming, biking, running, and playing softball, reading, and trying out new hobbies from glass blowing, photography, and cooking, to volunteering for community organizations. A round of applause for Zuzi, please. On July 5th, 2009, I sat at my desk overlooking the Potomac River in Washington, DC. On what was my four year work anniversary, I opened my email to find a company-wide voluntary separation offer. We had already gone through two rounds of involuntary layoffs, during which one of my best friends lost his job and moved back to Chicago. I had spent the last six months with a stress twitch over my left eye and discovered that being a manager in the middle of the biggest financial crisis of our lifetimes wasn't fun. I was stuck in that middle manager spot of knowing things didn't look good for us, but not being able to tell my staff, who were also my friends. I was also a graphic designer at a research company that hired Ivy League researchers who had a tendency to make me feel devalued and looked down on when I'd spent my whole life being seen as smart. I didn't feel fulfilled and I wasn't sure I belonged. I had moved there right after college in Milwaukee because I had friends from school who were going to the area to work in politics or journalism and the corporate executive board had offered me a job as a graphic design specialist. That's really what it was called, that's not a pseudonym. So armed with very basic knowledge of the area and a decent paying job, I found my first junior one bedroom apartment toward the end of the orange line in Virginia. So in Wichita terms, I was expecting people from Andover to come hang out with me in Mays and that didn't happen. So when they decided to raise the rent, I decided to move into the city where I could walk to work. I found a 400 square foot studio with a kitchen the size of a closet because it used to be a closet, a mini refrigerator and a two burner stove. <laughs> That was my worst decision ever, because the day I moved in, I discovered I had been left some pets, hundreds of cockroaches. After a year of waking up to imaginary clouds of baby cockroaches flying over my head, my lease was up, and I found my third place in DC, a 50 square feet more for only $1,300 a month. So now I had a choice to make, stay in that overpriced apartment and find a job in the middle of a recession, or move back to Wichita, where I can figure out what I want to be when I grow up. But growing up in Wichita, I had a picture of what home was, and I wasn't sure I fit into that yet either. Here in this great place to raise a family, home meant a house with a spouse and kids. I was still single, had no interest in buying a house, loved my public transportation, and had no idea what kinds of jobs were available besides working for my family. And then I saw an article about a condo being built downtown in a former warehouse, which was my grandfather's former warehouse. And in that article about a place yet to be created, I saw somewhere I might belong, where I might be able to bring some big city living with me to the place I had family, where I might be around for some of my then 12-year-old sisters growing up firsts. So I took, and it didn't have to be forever, right? So I took the severance, packed all my belongings into a rented SUV, and drove back home to Wichita. 
where I spent almost a year uh, working for my parents while living in their basement, watching a lot of HGTV and creating a t-shirt rug. Yep, I was one of those great recession millennials. <laughs> it wasn't my fault that it took them an extra six months to finish the apartment I picked out, okay? But in the meantime, my parents had a better social life than I did, and I was bored at home and at work. Because after eight years away, I didn't have any friends still here from high school, and I felt a bit like a stranger in my hometown. Making friends as an adult is hard, especially when you're sort of an introverted extrovert who really likes quality time with good people, but hates having to talk to them to meet the new people. <laughs> when you grow up feeling just outside the circle, not entirely sure how to find your way in. So after one of my aunts lovingly told me that I was never going to find a husband if I kept working for my family, I decided to check out Young Professionals of Wichita. That was one of my best decisions ever. Through YPW, I met my best friends, I got a better job, and then an even better job, and a promotion, and my current job. I have been behind the scenes at some of Wichita's coolest places. I have been to every brewery on the Wichita Brew Tour. I have a pretty great life. Um, but still, I don't always feel like I fit in here. I still haven't found that husband. Thank you, online dating. Um, I still don't have kids. <laughs> I still chafe a little bit every time the only selling point someone can come up with is that this is a great place to raise a family. I still miss really good public transportation, and I still see young professional women leaving the area because they don't see that future here. Despite all that, I have truly come to feel like I belong here at Wichita. And it's not because I finally bought a house, it's because I've discovered the times when I belong. I belong when I'm playing trivia with the crapshooters, when I am discussing books with my punk ass book club, when I am hanging out with my fun day crew, <laughs> when I am at work with my caring coworkers. Um, I belong when I feel valued, respected, and loved. Oh, and when I'm running with friends. Um, and these days, I feel that more often than I don't, and I belong here at home. Well done. It's a beautiful story. Wichita seems really fun. I think I'll come back and visit. <laughs> Our final speaker tonight is Gail Goolsby. Gail holds master's degrees in professional counseling and educational leadership. She has over 25 years educational experience as a teacher, school counselor, and principal, including the K through 12 American school in Afghanistan. Her award-winning book, Unveiled Truth, Lessons I Learned, leading the International School of Kabul, details the experience. As a counselor and ICF certified life coach, Gail believes that with support and encouragement, all can learn to live well. Gail and her pastor husband have been married 43 years and have three grown children, two son-in-laws, and five spunky grandchildren. They live where the wind blows over the prairie in South Central Kansas. Please welcome Gail. Thanks for hanging in here till the end. In the Wizard of Oz story, Dorothy ends up being a stranger in a strange land, albeit only in her mind. She meets different kinds of people, monkeys that fly, witches that dissolve, and many things she doesn't understand. And home becomes a compelling destiny, everything. In 2005, my husband and I left our mid Midwestern home and went to a strange place, and a strange place was Afghanistan. For seven years, I served as the founding principal of the International School of Kabul, part of the USAID package under the George W. Bush White House. The events that got me to this place were not unlike Dorothy's tornado, scary, life-changing. Three lessons I learned about how you create a sense of home in a new place are navigating culture, establishing a new identity, and building your new community. Afghanistan was a step back in time for me, like the end of the earth. It was a place ravaged by years of war, drought, and poverty. My life was comprised of beautiful mountain scenery, frigid cold winter nights, and sweaty hot summer days with no central heat, no central air. There were... Okay. 
Okay, sounds like I'm back in Afghanistan. All right. We did have bombs and we did have mortar blasts and we did have those kind of experiences, sometimes close by. There were days with no electricity, days with no internet, days with no hot water, but I had one thing all the time, homesickness. I never drove or walked anywhere by myself, sometimes in an armored vehicle with an armed escort with an, always the cumbersome headscarf. In the streets, we were assaulted by piercing male stares that never ceased prevailing trash and odors and the perpetual dirt on your feet, your hands, your face from the pollution and the constant dust. Afghan hospitality is amazing. They're quick to invite foreigners into their home, preparing extravagant meals, and even invite you to spend the night, even though you live down the street. On the flip side for a Western-raised woman is that Afghans, like many other cultures, have non-direct communication styles, non-time orientation, Low status of females, collective society loyalties, and many spiritual and, and superstitious traditions. The school expectations, when you're running to school and you have kids who don't think you need to come every day, you don't raise your hand if you have a question, you don't understand grading procedures, and you don't come if you don't want to because they're used to teachers not coming if they don't want to. But having a parent conference where the opening statement is, of course, you are the expert, was music to my ears. The lesson I learned is that not everything different in a culture is good or bad. Sometimes it's just different. And we should be willing to open up and learn about other cultures so we can relate to people in new and powerful ways. The transition from my American educator self to a expat female school leader in a male-dominated country was a huge shift. Not only was I new, a new principal, but I was a first-time overseas resident. We lived and worked on a closed compound, which is a whole new meaning to transparent leadership as you sit with the people that you're bossing around and eating and watching movies. My husband and I ended up being on marital display for much of our team who were younger and mostly single, and sometimes we didn't do a very good job. Our leader stress, our homesickness, and working together for the first time in married life took a toll. The lesson I learned here is we should close the gap between our public and our private selves for a true sense of identity no matter where you live. In these new situations, try out different aspects of your personality. It can produce some really good growth. Building new community. This is hard. It takes time, it takes intention, and it takes presence when you're meeting new people. Today, I take these same lessons to help the immigrants here in Wichita. A delight that I found a resettlement city here. We have about 800 Afghans living here among us. I'm in my second connection with an Afghan woman I meet with them a couple times a week, we practice English, and I help them navigate the Western culture. There's a local group here, Bridges Wichita, that helps to welcome new Afghan refugees. I also chair the Board of Morning Star Development, which is an organization dedicated to serving Afghans around the world. When I was doing my travel back and forth, like a woman with two lives, every spring, every Christmas, coming home to America, when I went through the passport control, they would always say, as they stamp it, welcome home. Every single time, I choked up and could hardly speak for a few minutes because when you are somewhere strange, there really is no place like home. As others helped me to navigate being a stranger in Afghanistan, I can offer the same compassion to people who have moved here many times, experienced tremendous trauma that we cannot understand, forming new identities, navigating a very interesting culture so that they can begin to feel like Kansas is really home. Thank you. Thank you, Gil. And thank you everyone for coming out tonight. I would like to take a second and ask all the storytellers to stand up so we can clap for them, if that's okay. give special thanks to KMUW and thank you to the Wichita Public Library and all the Big Read Planning Committee. I'm going to keep this very short here and share a poem about finding home in Kansas. I'm from a different place. My mother's from Panama. My father's from Puerto Rico. And people ask me where I'm from. I say, here. I'm a different kind of Kansan, a, a sunflower that planted a seed here 
his roots took hold and, and grew and blossomed in Kansas. So Kansas is home for me. This poem is called Per Aspera Ad Astra. We were lost in the plains, beautiful and ordinary, sunflowers in the fields, seeds of fallen stars, standing tall, deeply rooted in this land. I've admired how our flowers shine, grasping towards the sky, beyond the prairie grass, anchored down to earth, mimicking the sun. When a gardener plants the seeds of Helianthus, they are performing magic, raising stars out of the dust, where buzzing planets circle, half red moons set, and swarming comets float in orange comas. I've always felt that, late at night, in the bed of a truck, in the Kansas field, we were at the center of this universe, and I was exactly where I should be, amongst the flowers, not below. Thank you. Please remember to tip your waiters and bartenders. Thank you, everyone. Enjoy your homes and get home safely tonight. <laughs>